this week on the Roommates Podcast. Because yeah. some guys are going to spank a girl a little too hard. You know what happens when you spank a girl a little too hard? Bruises. Really bruise marks. Oh, shit. So the girl you love, your sweetheart, the one who you live and die for, the one who's like everybody, like lights up every cell in your own body. Yeah. She comes home from a weekend and she's just covered in bruise marks and bite marks. Damn. Like it makes you want to puke. Yeah. It makes you want to cry. It makes you want to like punch the wall. Like that feeling, go ahead, practice that. Yeah. Practice that all you yeah. want. But until you're there, until you're like there yeah. in it, yeah. you're not gonna be able to, you're not gonna be able to learn the lessons of that. What's good, everybody? This week's podcast is brought to you guys by our sponsors over at Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of amazing classes covering dozens of creative and entrepreneurial skills. You can take classes in everything from photography and creative writing to design, productivity, and more. So whether you're returning to a lifelong passion, challenging yourself to get outside your comfort zone, or simply exploring something new, Skillshare has classes just for you, and we've been telling you guys so much this year. Make sure you hop on Skillshare. So many dope, amazing classes. You guys will love it. So be sure to join the millions of people on Skillshare today with a special offer for the roommate community. You guys get two free months of Skillshare Premium. Use the offer code roommates at checkout. Go to Skillshare.com slash roommates. Two free months of Skillshare Premium. Check it out. Trust me, guys. You won't be disappointed with all the things that you'll be able to learn. And we are back. What's going on, player? My name is Afiz. Chris, the star of the show, baby. Yes, yes, yes. And we are in Austin, Texas. Yes, yes, yes. Dude, Good to be here, man. Dude, the capital. The past six days, <laughs> we've been in Atlanta. Yes, we have. Then we went to Los Angeles. Yes, we did. Then we went to Chicago, Detroit, Toronto. Mm, mm, mm. Then you went to Orlando. Yes, I did. And then we're here in the past six days. It's getting ridiculous. But it's not about <laughs> us. <laughs> it's not about us today. No, it's not. It's about our new guest. Our new I'm, roommate. Our new roommate. I'm sorry. How rude of me. Yeah, stop being no, disrespectful. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm, really, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. This is somebody who's been on my radar for a good bit. I'm really excited about his story. I'm really excited mm-hmm. about bringing him on to the show and the message that he's going to educate and encourage our audience with. Please welcome to the show the one and all, only Aubrey Marcus. What's good, my brother? What's going on, guys? Doing good, man. I like what yeah. you've done with the place, man. Thank you. It's yeah. nice, man. Yeah, well, it's, we're roommates now, yeah. so it's our, it's yeah. our place, yeah, so I'm know, glad I mean, you like it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm going to move in. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's already, it's already been said. Is that a Spartan yeah. outfit? That actually, the so the armor there is like 17th century Spanish cavalry armor. Wow. And it took like, if I, I'll show you later, but mm. if you peel off one of the buckles, it took a musket ball. So homie was riding on his horse oh, wow. trying to charge another army and somebody else with a musket hit him with a ball, probably knocked him off his horse. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe he was real strong though. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Like a he, just, he just took it. Took it like kept Terminator. It. <laughs> took it like Terminator. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows what happened to him, but the armor has like the little spot where the musket hit it, but it obviously saved his life. Oh, wow. And where'd you get one of those from, eBay? <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> yeah, my mom's got me that one. Oh, really? Um, Dang, shout out to Mama Dukes. Yep. yep. She got me that a long time ago. Maybe when I graduated college. It was oh, like wow. a, It was like one of the like big moment gifts you know so mm-hmm. i think it was when i graduated college so dope so, dope man. dope so for the people who don't know who you are aubrey can you give them a bit of an elevator pitch synopsis about who you are what you do and all that jazz i founded a company called on it in 2011 and that company's focused on total human optimization but i've always considered myself a writer and a philosopher uh I've published a book called own the day own your life which goes through an entire day of optimization practices from how you wake up to how you go to bed to everything in between um have my own podcast the aubrey marcus podcast Shout out. and um yeah i really like to just explore all of the unconventional ways to look at optimizing the human experience from mm. the physical body the mental body the emotional body the spiritual body relationships you know psychedelics i talk about a lot of different things that all kind of weave together under the banner of you know how do we live the best life we can Mm. and out of all of those things what would you say is the most important the most important is to head towards those areas that you're afraid of Mm. head towards those things that are struggles for you and and really master those things otherwise they're going to master you so you either you know master your fears or let fear be your master to a certain degree and there's a lot of ways to do that and so there's no one path like i can't say it's psychedelics or it's open relationship or it's sweat lodge or it's cold plunge or it's working out hard 
it's different for everybody because everybody has their natural strengths and their natural weaknesses, but like going to those areas where you could find the most growth, you know, so that's really what I think the most important thing. It's just having that warrior ethos and heading towards those areas that are difficult for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So since you're all about, you know, total optimization, on a scale of one to Thanos, <laughs> where, where, how optimized is your, is your life? You know, that's, that's a funny question. Uh, you know, I do a pretty good job with a lot of things, yeah. but there's sacrifices, right? I mean, there's sacrifices that you make. If you're going to run a marathon, like most marathon runners, when they come back from their marathon, they're sick. Like mm. they get respiratory tract infections or some like minor colds. It's pretty common that there's going to be an immune challenge from using your body to that extreme level. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't prepare. That doesn't mean that they didn't do everything they could. It just means that they're pushing their body to a level that requires more energy and more recovery than the average person would. Um, so in some ways, you know, I'm doing all of the optimization things. But in other ways, I'm willing to burn the candle at both ends and the middle if I want to get something done or I want to experience something that's really enjoyable. You know, like I'm comfortable going to Burning Man knowing that it's going to take me two weeks to recover when I go back home. That's not optimization. That's, you know, enjoying a wild, crazy experience that is, you know, available only at this one place at this one time for all of humanity. And I'm going to enjoy that and experience that. So... And then on the other side, on the converse, it could be work stuff where like I need to finish X many chapters of my book in X many days and I'm going to be working and writing 17 hour days back to back to back to back to back to finish this because then I got to get back to holding the CEO position here at on it and I got to do the other things. And that's not optimizing my health either. Mm. You know, so it's a, it's a combination of like doing all the things but recognizing there's going to be periods where I'm going to have to you know, make withdrawals and go into deficit and then spend the time to recover a little bit later. I like that. I see, I, that to me requires a lot of balance, a lot of time management. And like, what are some of the strategies that you personally do to balance everything? It's, yeah, it does. Because otherwise you just crash, yeah. right? Like if you don't take the time to balance, if you're just sprinting, 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 going marathon to marathon to marathon, you're going to get really sick. It's not going to be a, a nose cold. It's going to be pneumonia or it's mm -hmm. going to be something you know way worse that you're going to have to deal with. It's really going to be like the universe throwing you on the bench, being like, you got to take a break now, son. You know, mm -hmm. like That's going to be how it'll go if you don't find that balance. So it's about just having that kind of intrinsic meter. It's almost like a compass you know, or like one of those... Um, what do they call those things you put on the wood that you know level it's just like level. a level yeah, yeah. yeah it's like a level right like so i know where the little bubble is yeah. and if the bubble's on too far on this side i, like I know the tools to bring the bubble back to the middle if it's too far on the other side i know i have some room to go mm -hmm. to kind of balance it out mm -hmm. uh, on the other side so it's a really for me it's about having all the tools and knowing how to utilize those tools and then knowing intrinsically like when i need to utilize that and that's a lot of really listening to my body and listening to my inner knowing yeah. Now, what I like about that is um, how you brought up that there's going to be seasons when things are are not going to be perfect. And there's a lady that we talked to, we we're talking to her name is Danielle Jones. She's a, she's um, a OBGYN and her first year residency, she had twins. So, and then she got married. So, you know, can imagine yeah, yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. the life, but she talks about like balance isn't like a day-to-day -day thing, meaning that 25% family, 25% work, 25%, you know, this every single day. Sometimes it's going to be a season where, like you said, it's going to be emphasis on work yep. and an emphasis on maybe family, emphasis on, you know, spirituality or, you know, whatever it may be. But overall, looking at the grand scheme of things, like, is my life fully balanced in the grand picture? Do you, do you feel that way, like, when you look at things as well? 100%. And it's yeah. just about what perspective you want to look at it in, yeah. you know, and sometimes you could honestly look at the last since July of 2011 when, you know, we launched Alpha Brain and on it really hit the map. Yeah. You could look at that in some ways as a certain type of season, mm. you know, and that season has been largely a high work output season, you know, launching a company and building it is going to be one of those periods, but it's been interspersed with other smaller, you know, quieter break periods and other kind of more, chill times as well and also if you kind of tracked my 
partying days. So you'll, you'll see that those were a lot higher and heavier leading up to when I started the company, and then those have faded off a lot yeah. more since. So things ebb and flow in the micro and in the macro, mm-hmm. you know. But ultimately, yeah, I think when you look back at your life, you're going to want to see certain different periods where you focused on certain things because sometimes that's what it's required. You know, mm. you can't just live a perfectly balanced day every day. I, I mean, some people can be that regimented. I'm, I'm not. Mm. You know, I, I'd rather dive into something that I'm really passionate about and go all in yeah. and then figure out the counterbalance later. Yeah. So um, me and Chris, like we've been doing this show. <laughs> What's so funny? I'm ready, man. I want to dive into. The, I want to dive into. It. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but me and Chris, you know, we've been doing this show for about three years, mm-hmm. and a lot of times we bring in people, and they, you know, are great entrepreneurs, great business leaders, great in all different types of fields, and everybody sees for the most part, the finished results. They see the amazing facilities, you know, with the beautiful women walking everywhere, man. I love that. That's this. how I, I, I love my parents. I always see what happens is mine. Man. That's you the know. goddamn problem. <laughs> you know, I, like everything is dope and they see the end result, but they don't see like the building blocks to how you got there. So for the people, can you take us on a bit of a time travel into DeLorean to let us know like from the very beginning, how did you get from being this large amazing company to from ground zero well you have to go back a long way actually because there was a pivotal moment and that moment was becoming friends with joe rogan Mm -hmm. and those of you who listen to podcasts should know who joe rogan is he's got one of the most one of the biggest podcasts in the world if not the very biggest podcast in the world so And he's influential comic and influential, you know, he's a commentator for the UFC. He's got a lot of different roles that he plays. He was on the host of Fear Factor, et cetera. Anyways, we became friends about 10 years ago before the founding of Onnit. But that moment of becoming friends with Joe Rogan was not like an accident, Mm. you know, because I had to be a person that was able to be friends with someone Mm. as great as Joe Rogan. And that journey started really young and really early. My you know, extra reading of books, my interest in philosophy, my interest in studying and exploring different you know, topics that were unusual or kind of piqued my curiosity. And then at 18, I went on a vision quest where I did psilocybin mushrooms in the mountains mm-hmm. with, uh, mm-hmm. with a shaman. And I was actually, at that point, actually, I was an atheist. And then I found this intense experiential spirituality and was like, Oh God, literally. Yeah. So you God know? showed up? Well, the the divinity within us okay. showed up, right? So what what you would call your soul. Gotcha. You know, if you were gonna use the religious context. Mm-hmm. And you people have a lot of words. These words have a lot of connotations and charge depending on how you were brought up. But I'm I'm comfortable calling it my soul. I got to experience what my soul was like. And I didn't think I had a soul. I mm-hmm. thought I was just a body and a mind. And then all of a sudden my body and my mind evaporated and my soul was there. And if my soul is there, then what is the collective soul of everything? Well, you could call that God. You know, so it was like this whole, I went in this kind of angry atheist, like, mm-hmm. what, what do you mean? This doesn't make sense. And then I did this vision quest, and then I came out like, wow, I just experienced my soul. I got to rethink this whole thing. Was it in South America? This was actually in North America. So oh, this wow. was a North American, trained in kind of the, the Mexican Oaxacan you know, mu- like mushroom tradition. Okay. And this shaman took me out in the mountains. Actually, it was in New Mexico. Okay. But um, that was a real, a real blessing that I was able to do that at 18. That was 20 years ago. Mm. So that was my first psychedelic medicine journey that led me down a path of experiencing a lot of the different psychedelic medicines that the world has to offer from Iboga, from Gabon in Africa, which is the subject of that painting behind my head there, mm-hmm. to Ayahuasca, the subject of that painting over there some, in front some, of the couch. Some great and, pictures, man. And psilocybin and Wachuma and all of these different medicines that have been the great sacraments of our time. So... That was one part of it. That was a level of things that gave me experiential knowledge, not just the knowledge that you get from books, but also like something that I could really touch and feel and talk about. And then, you know, all of the different business endeavors, but that continued effort to try and be great and try and learn and try and accumulate as much knowledge and interesting, you know, and be the most interesting person I could possibly be. um, That all ultimately led to the friendship with Joe Rogan, right? Because I was able to set up through, you know, different business means like a 30 minute business coffee mm. 
dad was going to talk about podcast advertising on his brand new podcast, the Joe Rogan Experience, when Crazy. it was like real early, right? So mm -hmm. I managed to get in early, be recognized that podcast advertising was going to be a thing. And because of my dig I had like a digital marketing company, so I kind of identified that that was going to be a thing, got a 30-minute meeting with him about that being the topic. But my entire life of the psychedelic medicine journeys, my study of philosophy, all my knowledge, ended up turning that 30-minute meeting into a four-hour you know, dinner. We were hanging. That we became dope. friends, right? Then that friendship, then over two years, we continued that friendship. And then ultimately, I came to him and said, hey, what supplement would you like to take the most? And then that's what was the foundation of Alpha Brain, which is on its flagship, which is really what allowed on it to become initially the company that it is now. So the reason I went all the way back is if I didn't if I didn't become the person that Joe Rogan could look in the eye and say, Hey brother, like you're my friend. You know, like you've done enough things, you've accumulated enough interesting experiences, you are the type of person that I want to be friends with, then I would have never had Joe Rogan as a business partner. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't have Joe Rogan as a business partner, then it would have been a long, slow, like long, slow grind trying to build on it up from scratch. But with him as a business partner, we started talking about it on the podcast and it really took off almost immediately. Yeah. And then from there, it's been about surfing the momentum of having a partner of that magnitude and having that built-in audience and then just trying to be additive to everything we do from that and continue to grow the company from there, which has plenty of challenges. Mm -hmm. But the real key part was... I understood how to build and launch a company and how to resource and like source enough information and people to build the products. And he knew he knew how to reach an audience. So it was a perfect partnership that was in some ways, you know, my whole lifetime in the making to try and be the person that could be that guy's partner. Because it wasn't he wouldn't have done it if it was just like a business deal. Mm -hmm. Like, hey man, here's this business deal and I'm just this kid, you know, but because we were friends. And because it made sense, because he trusted me, because of the work that I'd done, then we were able to do it. That's really interesting. I, I feel like that it built up because you really decided to explore your true self. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, during that time when you was 18, 19, you were figuring yourself out, were you trying to be somebody else or you were you just didn't know exactly what your true self looked like? I had no idea. I, I mean, if you don't know that you have consciousness, awareness, soul... If you don't know that that's a part of you, you really don't know who you are, mm. you know, because that is the that's the most stable part of you because your mind is always going to change. Your ego is going to attach itself to different identities. You know, the moment you get a new job, your ego has a new identity. I'm Aubrey, the CEO on it. Well, that's only eight years old, but that's part of my identity. I'm Aubrey, the New York Times bestseller. Well, that's a year old, you know, but your ego is always evolving and changing. But that soul, that essence of who we are that doesn't really change. You know, that's that's the that's the constant, you know, and that's that kind of loving awareness that we have, the ability to witness who we are. And without knowing that part of myself, well, you know, everything else is just a moving target. So I don't think I think that's why so many people have a hard time like knowing themselves because everything else is in flux except for your soul. Your body is changing constantly, your mind is changing constantly, your ego is changing constantly. So it's impossible to know yourself. You could know your past self, but you can't know your current self because your current self is always going to be a little bit different than your past self. And that's where I think people run into a lot of trouble unless you're talking about your soul, which is that steady presence that kind of rides with you through your whole life. So this might be doing your soul injustice. <laughs> but mm -hmm. if you were to describe your soul in one word, how would you describe your soul to be? Love. Love. Why? I think it's the mind that creates all of the separation, all of the division, all the competition, all of the different things that is kind of necessary. I mean, we're in a planet that competes for resources. Even animals compete with each other for mating rights, for you know, breeding privileges for food, for power, for who's going to be the alpha of the pack, who's going to, and then there's some collective community, you know, I think like humans reached um, where we are as a species because we were great at building community and great at like working together. And that's what allowed us to kind of dominate the rest of the species on this earth. But 
ultimately that still led to a sense of tribalism where it was still us versus them, our tribe, our people versus those people. And, but all of that's kind of the mind and the body, um, whereas the soul recognizes everything as same, like you are just me living a different life, you are just me living a different life. So when you recognize same, the only natural response is love, right? Like, because you love yourself, you should at least, mm, yeah. you know? And so if you love yourself and everybody is you and everything is you, then you should love that too. And so that's why the soul, I think, can be best described as love. So that's interesting. So you think that the way you're describing soul, it's a collective human soul. So you don't think that there's certain individual souls that could potentially not be love? No, I think the souls are always love. Okay. But I think the minds can the minds can be anything. The minds okay. can be hate. Yeah. The minds can be violence. The minds can be all kinds of things. But they're just blind to their own soul, just like I was when I was 17. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I had a soul. I mean, I wasn't into hate and violence. I was into being the best basketball player that possibly could. If, you know, okay, I was wh like which which uh, what position? I was shooting guard. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, we're gonna have to test it out. Oh, let's go. Let's go. Let's I got go. the shoes and the coat. <laughs> let's go. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, so I mean, I think there's a lot of aspects, but we can we have that ability to ignore, deny, not be aware of that part of ourself that is love, and mm. tons of people do that. I mean, okay. I would say the majority of people are acting out of accordance with their soul. Mm. And I think one of the things that we need to do as humanity is like get back in touch with our soul, get back in touch with that part of us that is love. Because mm. when we get back in touch with that, with that, like all of these problems that we see go away. When we love the planet, then we start to take care of it. When we love each other, then we start to build bridges instead of you know the divisiveness that we've seen categorize particularly the 20th century and before, but even now, you know, it's maybe getting better, but it's still shit, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and so really getting in touch with that part of us that is love, I think is one of the ways that we're gonna heal as a society. That's interesting, because it mm -hmm. reminds me of, like we're on tour with a guy, do hey, you know of a guy named um, Stefan Labossier? Mm -mm. Instagram named Stefan Speaks. You should check mm -hmm. him out, man. Mm -hmm. You definitely, definitely will love his content, yeah. definitely resonates him. So we're on tour with him right now and one of the things Stefan always talks about is healing. Yep. And that's like literally when, as, as Aubrey's been talking, like that's what I've been hearing in regards to like some of that um, psychedelic experience regardless of people's views on it. It was a point of healing for you. It was. Because you were saying that you were angry, you were frustrated, you were bitter, you were lost, you were confused, and then you had this experience and then you then found the love inside of you. Yep. And so one of the things that Stefan talks about all the time is that in today's world, so many people have gone through so much pain and hurt and frustration and disappointments and less let down. They're so disconnected um, to their true selves and they're so, um, they've adopted the pain as their new identity. And getting back to healing and getting back to that pure self that you described is what he, is like his life's mission. And um, so it's, I think it's just really dope just kind of hearing you talk about it from a whole different angle, but it's the message it's the same, is still the same, it's the thing. same thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's what you find at the heart of most religions, most philosophies. It's all kind of getting back to the same thing, you know, like tell the truth and love each other. Yeah. You know, like that's like yeah. if you want to boil everything down, like quiet the mind, tell the truth, love each other. Like everybody's talking about the same thing, which is another way to talk about knowing God or, you know, expressing that part of us that is a part of God. You yeah. know, it's all, it's really gets very simple. It's just different lenses by which we look at this stuff. Now, simple doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah, yeah. I was it's, going to it's, it's, yeah. it's super hard. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. hardest journey to make because yeah. the mind and the ego is really stubborn. You talk about ego a lot. Can mm. you can you break down? Because I, I remember hearing the conversations you were having with Gary, and one of the things Gary talked about was that in the English language, people kind of the ego was kind of seen as with confidence, seen as a virtue, not a vice. Yeah. And from the way you describe an ego, it sounds to me more of a vice. Mm -hmm. If I'm if I'm correct, I think it's neither. Okay. I think it's a it's a necessary it's a necessary tool to individuate people. Okay. Right, the ego is the part of us that says, "I am the most important." Okay. And that's actually, we actually need that because otherwise we would just kind of collapse into this blob of, you know, like 
Should I eat this sandwich or should you eat this sandwich? Yeah, 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 I don't yeah, yeah, yeah. even know because yeah. like we're all the same. Yeah. So like everything would be really confusing. So mm. the ego is like important to differentiate us as people and okay. allow us to have these interactions and allow us to like enjoy and explore and have our own, you know, desires and our own proclivities, the food that we like, the things that like make us make us light up and the art we want to create and all of that's kind of mixed in with the ego. So I think it can have some really positive attributes and I don't think we'll ever be able to shed it. I think it's an important part of our experience here on this earth. Okay. But I think it can get overblown and I think it needs mm -hmm. to be counterbalanced by the soul. So like the ego unchecked by the soul, which is the part of us that knows that we're all one and it's all love, then that's when things get out of control. You know, so it's like the branches of the government, right? Like in the, if all the branches of the government are working well, you know, you have the executive, the judicial, and then the, you know, the, the House and the Senate, the legislative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So all three of those are, mine, are meant to be checks and balances so that yeah. every, no one gets too out of power. Yeah. But the problem is, is like right now, so that's mind, which is the ego, and then there's the soul, and then there's the body. And those are the three things that should be in balance in a human being. But for most people, the ego is way out of balance. It's like, completely dominant too much concern with self too mm -hmm. much concern with self too much concern with power too mm -hmm. much concern with comparing itself to other people the ego really only knows how to judge itself comparatively so it looks it looks around and says like how am i doing compared to others so it wants to be better than others wants to push others underneath it mm -hmm. it wants to be the dominant force and that's what feeds the ego mm -hmm. but when that gets out of control and it's not checked by love and it's not checked by the body itself like the animal that we actually are then that's i think when we run into problems so all three are valuable but they all can yet become a problem when they become too dominant hmm. and i actually think the soul can become too dominant too and i think the body can become too dominant too it's just less common you know like if the if the soul is too dominant you might form you might be one of those ascetics who just like sits in a monastery and doesn't really eat and is wasting away and never knows the pleasures of sex and just eats porridge, like, <laughs> porridge. porridge. Yeah. like i don't i don't think that's what we're here for yeah, yeah, yeah. you know like cool if that's what you want to do but like i don't think that's why we have bodies yeah. like we have dicks for a reason you know, like we're supposed to <laughs> use, use them guys yeah, we're supposed to use them right like yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. I, it just makes sense to me yeah, yeah, yeah. you know we have taste buds for a reason that's not just to eat porridge <laughs> you know it's like it's like explore like experience different parts of life but their soul is a little bit too dominant to have a balanced existence and that's fine you know it's probably better to be that way than an egomaniac yeah, right yeah, yeah. better ra rather be a soul maniac than an egomaniac. <laughs> yeah, yeah and then if the body's too in charge and we're too driven by our own lusts and too driven by our own you know vanity in certain cases it kind of gets woven in with the ego but the body could be just too too much like that kind of animal nature that mm. we can't really control and temper mm. and so that can be a problem too but i think the biggest problem is for sure the people who are too ego dominant so I'm going. I want to go around the table, starting with Aubrey. <laughs> yeah. So out of those three, ego, soul, and body, which one do you think is been the thing that's caused you the most problems in life, and then why? Ego, for okay. sure. Yeah, like no doubt about it. Yeah. Because you know, it's the problem is is that the ego is part of what tells us that we only deserve to be loved and we're only worthy of love if we accomplish x things if we if we're able to do this thing or that thing so i never really allowed myself and you, we learn that from everybody like our parents teach us mm -hmm. that like even you know my dad he did the best he could but like I felt more love from him when I scored 25 than when I scored 12. Mm. You know what I mean? Like if I had a bad game, if I went like one for seven instead of like, you know, six for 10 or whatever, like I felt a different thing from him. He was a little quieter in the car ride home. Mm. You know, like it was like the hug was a little, it wasn't the same thing, right? So it was like this, even in, even just playing basketball, it was conditional. And like when I got a bad report card, you know, or if I like when I was going to apply for colleges, like all of these things, I had a different expression of love from my father. Same with, same with teachers, same with coaches, same with your friends, same with your girls, same with everybody teaches you this conditional form of love. And then eventually you internalize it. And you're like, I'm only worthy of love unless if I'm kicking ass. 
But kicking ass is like a moving target, mm -hmm. you know? So you're always chasing, always chasing. So I never really felt like I was worthy of love ever. And I had this kind of constant anxiety and depression. The anxiety was the anxiety of, you know, wondering if I'm doing enough to be worthy of love. And then depression was those moments where I'm like, I'm never going to be able to do enough, you know? And so it's just this kind of thing that rode with me for most of my life. And that's based on what the ego and what the mind has been taught by society, which is a very conditional form of love. I'm right there with you. Yeah. Uh, definitely ego. It's very similar to you. Like I kind of look at uh, my family as like God to me. So when they say good things, like, you know, they give, they give me power, especially the mm. words give me so much power. But I remember, always remember the negative things. And that really affects me. That gives me my confidence. That gives me my identity, basically. And that's kind of how I always move. So if I don't get um, the words or the, the confidence from, you know, my family, okay, I'll go get it from my friends. Oh, if I don't get it from both of them, okay, I'll get it from girls. And that's how like, I identify as like, man, I'm, even, I'm always hurting myself, number one, but I know the byproduct is mainly the women getting hurt. So I definitely uh, relate to that for sure. Yeah. Hmm. You know, I, I'm going I'm to go a little differently here. I think in, from what you described as body, I think for me it's the body. Because I think for me it's a sense of I have always struggled with the ability of doing what I don't feel. And feeling isn't even just like, like I feel like doing it because I'm going to gain something, but just like, just it's any type of feeling. Like, even if it's like, okay, doing something kind for my mother, like I know it will make me feel good, but like, I just don't want to do it. So mm -hmm. to me, it's always been like, a, 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 I've always felt like my body has crippled me, mm -hmm. like because of some of the giftingness, the way I'm built um, just biologically, in my personal opinion, because I don't know how you feel about this, but I, but I believe that all your greatest strengths are also your greatest weaknesses. And so it's kind of the way, in my opinion, God balances out the world to keep somebody from being so amazing, or not so amazing, to, to keep people from being perfect. Um, and so for me, it, it's like having such a strong drive based upon emotional passion mm. causes me to struggle when there is no emotional passion. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm great at doing work like this, but I was always a really crappy employee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. I was always yes. a really crappy yes, employee. Yes. So I've always, I've always, so like when, like learning about your story and about disciplining of the body and all these things, like that's something that I'm really getting to even regards emotional intelligence and stuff like that. Being able to not let the body drive me off of it's just impulses that either lead me in one direction or the other. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I think one thing that you can try to help practice that, it's a skill I call mental override. It's when the body really doesn't want to do something. So, like, imagine going into cold plunge. You ever do any cold plunges or cold showers? Um, I bath. used to. Ice baths? Yeah. yeah, for sports. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, there's, like, really powerful physical mental benefits from doing that, just willingly, not even for just muscle mm -hmm. recovery. Um, but the other interesting part of it is... When you're looking at that ice bath, like it's the last fucking thing you want to do. <laughs> yeah. you want to yeah. do. You're like, yeah. I don't want to go in this thing. But you do it anyways, yeah. right? And like that ability to do that thing that you don't want to do mm. is a skill that we can learn. That's true. You know, and That's it's just true. that like, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to do it. And that could be doing something for work. That could be doing something for your body. That could be doing something. That could be eating something you know you should. That should be going for a run or going for a swim or doing whatever the thing is that you don't want to do at that moment. But no, I'm like, I'm just going to do it. Mm. Here I go, putting on my shoes. I'm going outside like I'm going for a walk. Like that ability, I think, is a skill that we can train. And it's just, you know, for, for you, finding those things that you can just say, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to fucking do it anyways. Yeah. You know, yeah. that'll be really helpful. No, that's funny because when I graduated college, I was working at a, a summer camp and I hate manual labor. <laughs> so um, the week before, <laughs> so funny. <laughs> and you're not good at it either. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but uh, so the summer before I had, um, they had like this thing called Uncle Week where you mm. basically had to go into the woods because the camp was in the woods in Branson, Missouri and set up the camp. And because I knew I hated manual labor so much, I did that. 
and I and I spent that whole week mm. like doing like cleaning bathrooms and sweeping floors and moving spiders from bed bunks and all types of things. So that I don't believe it's us either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the camp didn't open that year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it actually made me never want to do that ever again. <laughs> I was like, nope. Learn my lesson. I did that experience and I don't want to go back to it. So uh, so no, that's that's funny. Um another thing that I think about when I'm thinking about your story is like I see somebody like you're big into philosophy. Um, you big into you big into stoicism, Marcus Aurelius. I, am, yeah. I had a feeling you were. <laughs> so, one of the things in um, in the Bible, author Solomon in the Book of Proverbs says, "The greater my wisdom, um, the greater my troubles." And um, it's something in which I feel as though it's true because the hardest part about knowing all the right things to do is the inability at times to do all those right things. So do you ever feel a struggle with like you're constantly reading, you're constantly learning, you're knowing everything about optimization, knowing you're learning and gaining so much about how to be the best version of self. Do you ever feel like a tension between knowing all the right things to do and just unfortunately not being able to be all things that you want to be? Yeah, I think that's an issue that a lot of people run into. I think it's actually a I think it's actually something that accelerates and then it, you can actually get over the hump and then have it decelerate. Mm. Um, you know, if you look back to antiquity and the, you know, who was the person who was regarded as the wisest person in the world was Socrates. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Socrates proclaimed famously, I know nothing. Yeah. Right? Like, so he was so comfortable with the fact that even though he knew more than most, maybe more than any at the time, the thing that he really knew was that he, virtually knew nothing because there was so much to know and i think so he was comfortable with his wisdom you know and comfortable not claiming and expecting that he would have all the answers or expecting that he would get it all right or expecting that he was going to be perfect so and i think that's an aspect of wisdom that you can come to where you can start to understand that you're always going to be somewhat ignorant you always you're always going to have a lot more to learn and it's okay and like that is ultimately like a wisdom that you can arrive at because otherwise it will be paralyzing because you'll know a million different things that you could do at this certain point in time but that you don't do but eventually greater wisdom is releasing that and knowing that probably the best thing that you can do is relieve your stress right like it's worse it's worse to stress about what you eat you know than to eat something shitty Mm. so like if you eat let's say you eat like a bunch of chicken. pasta, yeah, or like, yeah, yeah you, eat your, you eat that, you eat the Popeyes chicken sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. The lucky few people that get that thing. <laughs> I, do you know why they don't have that? I just found out yesterday why they didn't have that. Oh, why? Well, I thought they ran out of chicken, but they didn't run out of chicken. It's fucking Popeyes. They got an unlimited amount of chicken. Yeah. They ran out of bread. Oh, oh see that? Yeah, I, I think that. I heard that. I, heard I, heard that. I, heard that. <laughs> I didn't know that. I was like, how do you? How are you Popeyes and, and you, you run, run out, out of chicken? Chicken <laughs> doesn't make any sense to me. They're yeah. like, no, no, they didn't run out of chicken. They ran out of the bread. That's insane. And yeah, then they were Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then they ha- apparently some of them were like, you can have your bring your own bread Popeyes oh, man, chicken sandwich. Okay, now people were coming in with like like Wonder Bread. But anyways, let's say you eat that chicken sandwich, and let's say you know that like know that gluten in some of the products of wheat are inflammatory and you know that when you fry fats they become unhealthy and also inflammatory and you know all the different things that are going on you know they're using corn oil and the mayonnaise that is in the coleslaw that is in the sauce and like you think about all that and then you're stressed for the next six hours thinking that you just put poison in your body Mm. the stress about what you ate is going to be way worse for you than if you just happily ate that fucking chicken sandwich and was like that was delicious (laughs) i'm glad i got one yeah because that good feeling would signal to your body and they've done studies on this as well giving people like identical different like smoothies yeah and saying like this smoothie is super healthy it's going to be really good for you and then someone drinks it and their body responds in this really positive way like hormonally mm. and how it re- how it reacts and then they give somebody a smoothie it's the same smoothie but they're like the smoothie is super indulgent it's like a milkshake that's really bad for you mm. and then they drink that and their body responds in this totally different way right mm. so what we have to realize is one of the most important things that we can remember is our attitude about certain things. So yeah, if you're going to eat the dessert, just eat it, enjoy yeah. it, you yeah. know, don't eat it every time, yeah. you know, but like don't stress so much, you know, it's because even if you look at the centenarians and super centenarians the people who've lived 
like over 100 and over 110 years old, you're, you're not going to find a lot of commonality in their diet. You're not going to find a lot of commonality in a lot of the things. You're going to find that they had typically a strong group of friends and that they didn't stress much. Mm-hmm. But other than that, some of them are like, had smoked a cigarette like the oldest woman in the world smoked a cigarette after every meal from age 17 to 117 that's insane right and like some some person had three dr peppers a day and like <laughs> lived to like 115 yeah. like another person was like 12 cigars and a nip of whiskey, like, <laughs> nip of whiskey. <laughs> but you know what their yeah. attitude was yeah. always so good about yeah. it and they believed that this was part of what made them healthy so like that positive belief system is so much more important than you know it's not the the things that you do do matter it's mm-hmm. not like there's not a consequence to smoking a cigarette or anything like that like you can co- totally overpower it but attitude matters as well as the actual things that you do yeah i see that as a common uh commonality to your story that like once you found um your soul then you realize that the mind plays a part into everyday life yep so you use the tools like that you said you had but i like what? Are, what are some of those tools to really battle those minds when negative thoughts come in, that stress come in? It's like, so what are some of those tools? <clears throat> well, stoicism is one tool, okay. right? So stoicism teaches you that the, it's kind of something similar that you were saying. Like your greatest weaknesses are your greatest strengths. Mm-hmm. Like your greatest challenges are often your greatest blessings. Yeah. And we can look back at our life and realize like those things that we thought were like, how did this ever. happen? This is the worst thing ever. Mm-hmm. We grew the most from those things. Yeah. And that's a, that's a classic Stoic philosophy. It's yeah. why Ryan Holiday wrote the book, The Obstacle is the Way. Like mm-hmm. resistance becomes your assistance. So, mm-hmm. And so initially what I said at the start, like find those areas that are your fears, that are your struggles and go hunt those things so that they don't come hunting you. That's good. So that Stoic philosophy, that way when something bad happens to you, bad in quotes you don't look at it as bad you look at it as a challenge Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you look at it like okay here's a challenging thing here's an opportunity for me to respond and adapt and grow and i'm and i'm grateful for it like i got in a car accident about a year ago which was really fluke thing i've never passed out i mean i'm i used to drink a lot i've never blacked out i've never lost memory or consciousness not Mm -hmm. one time in my life never fainted Mm -hmm. i used to spar like heavy I've never gotten knocked out. Like Mm -hmm. my brain is tenacious, Mm -hmm. it doesn't shut off. But whatever, for whatever reason, sober, I had a nice night the night before, middle of the day, passed out leaving my driveway of my car, slammed, accelerated. I got one of those ludicrous Teslas. So I accelerated into the guardrail like super fast. And the guardrail cut through my car and split my face open. I had like 300 stitches. It almost slit. You can see the the scars on my neck, almost slit my throat. Wow. But I, I woke up in the hospital, and because of the deep understanding of the philosophy of that whatever the hardest challenge is is going to be your greatest blessing, like I knew immediately that that accident happened for me. And I'm a pile of blood and mess, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm crying, calling my girl, saying like, hey, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened, but I'm in the hospital, like, I'm so sorry. And I just felt bad that she was going to have to take <laughs> yeah, care of me, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, but that moment, from that moment, I never felt, I never, I never got down on myself. I never felt bad. I was like, this happened for me, not to me. Yeah. And so that, that ability of the mind kept my mind so much more positive. And when I'm did actually, you get that switch? When was that? I feel like stoicism to me is like a lifelong process. It is, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, and the funny thing is like I'm better at it with the big stuff than I am with the little stuff. Mm, give me an example. Yeah, give me an example. <laughs> like I could... Um, Let's say I woke up with like, um, and I knew I had to do this podcast today and I woke up and I had like a sore throat. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, God damn it, it's a sore throat, it's so fucking stupid. I'm like, and I'd get all flustered and I'd, I'd get all like annoyed and mad or if I had the sniffles, I'd be all, all, all really mad about it, mm-hmm. right? But if I woke up and like, the ceiling caved in and like crashed on me. And I was yeah. like in the hospital, I'd be like, wow, that happened for me, not to oh, me. Wow. You know what I mean? Like, wow. like so I'm, I'm actually able to easier apply it to like big stuff than I am to like why? the little annoying stuff. I don't know why. <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense because I guess, 
I guess because when it, I guess the the press, the greater the pressure, the more I have to adapt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it forces me. You know, like some teams play better against better teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. you rise to the level mm -hmm. of your competition. competition. Yeah, and I guess that's kind of what's going on to me. Like I rise to the level of the stressor <laughs> yeah. that's that's hitting me. That makes and sense. if it's something that's trivial, then it allows. I just let my ego handle it, which my ego doesn't know how to handle it at all. And yeah. It's like blah blah blah. blah. <laughs> why 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 me why me why me? Yeah. Huh. That makes so much sense. Like, I I literally never thought about it like that. I'm I'm really good with terrible situations. Like I'm really I'm mm -hmm. when terrible things happen for some reason I always stay level headed. But when stupid stuff happens, like <laughs> yeah. freaking my car <laughs> break down and I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. 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 I'm with you. I'm with you. I'd much rather get in an accident than like <laughs> yeah. my freaking car and just stop working all of a sudden. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, Gosh. it's it's interesting thing that I think and that's something that we can all learn from. We can all learn to like be like, okay, why don't I handle this like I would handle a, a yeah. bigger situation? And then my life would be a lot happier and more peaceful because most of the time it is the little stuff, you know, and the big stuff is harder to deal with, so it's less fun anyway. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um really kind of keeping that in the forefront of my mind and learning how to handle the little stuff a little better with a little more grace mm -hmm. and a little more ease, that would be helpful. Um, so anyway, so Stoic philosophy in, in and of itself is one tool. Yeah. You know, that's just like one mental framework. But there's physical ways to get out of it. Like again, like the cold plunge. If you're stressed about something or I did this last night, I could feel myself as a little stressed, a little anxious. So I went, I have a chest freezer that's filled with cold water and uh, it's about 40 degrees and I just dipped in there and just lay in there and I could just feel you know, my body like sinking into the cold. And it was just like a beautiful reset. It took about three minutes. And I just felt different on the way out mm. than I went in, you know, swimming 10, 20 laps in my pool. It's not a lot. It's not like I'm trying to be, you know, Michael Phelps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just like getting in, moving my body. That'll change my state of being or getting in the sauna or like yeah. any little thing like that can change your physical state, which can change your mental state. That's a tool. And then there's like the spiritual practices, whether that's just meditation or whether that's, you know, going and doing a plant medicine journey, you know, whatever, whatever it is, or breath work or all kinds of different things. Um, those are all really helpful tools too. Mm. So I'm, I'm really curious too. like, I, like the more I'm learning about you, I see there's just so much, so much different interest. Like you talked about so many different interests, like you're reading, you're learning, there's a lot going on in your life. Like when it comes to your relationship, like, how did you find somebody who connects with you when you're such a, a unique individual? Like, how, like, was that challenging for you? Hmm. Well, I, man, I mean, I don't know how much you follow my story, but I had a very unconventional relationship. You yeah. know, I had an open relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, that really allowed me to connect with different people who had different ways that they connected with me, which didn't force any one person to uh, have to carry the entire load of connecting with me on every different category. Yeah. Now, Whitney, my most long-standing partner and the person I live with um, for the longest, we've you know subsequently split up, but we're still really close and really tight friends. Um, she was the person that I had the most fun with, you mm -hmm. know, like, and she was also one of the most athletic. So, like, we could always go surfing together. We could always work out together. We could go to the boxing gym together. We could do, we could go dancing. She's amazing. Like, we could go dancing together. She's probably the funnest person to go party with that I've ever known in my mm. life, right? Mm. So, like, so many ways that we could have fun. And then she slowly started to grow in her spiritual understanding and grow in her philosophical understanding and then open up her own ability to express her art through her voice. And But that wasn't all there at the start. At the mm. start, we just had a fucking blast together. Yeah. You know, and and then other people who I would meet, we would have different ways that we would connect and different things that were really interesting about that. And it allowed me the freedom to kind of connect on multiple levels. Now, of course, I was just thinking about me, you know, and like all the people that I would connect with. I didn't think about how hard it would be when she started connecting with other mm. people too. And what do you mean by connecting? <laughs> I mean having <laughs> sex with other people. Man. <laughs> <laughs> like that, I was I was totally blindsided by how hard that would be, mm. Mm. Um, and that was again one of my greatest teachers. You know, so you, so w w 
beginning with that girl, have you done open relationships in the past, or was like she like the inception of it? She was the inception because mm. we were, you know, we were monogamous for two years, okay. and at that point, um, I was like, look, I I just want to experience other people, and in some ways, to be tell you the truth, like I needed to experience other people because I was still using the people I was sleeping with as validation mm. for myself. Like for I ego. needed people to to want me, to want myself, yep. to like love myself. Like yep. if they didn't want to have sex with me, then I didn't think that I was worthy of love, right? Yeah. So like, and I think a lot of men and women get in that trap where that's we're using true. our lovers to validate yep. ourselves. That's very true. And I was still stuck in that paradigm and stuck in that trap without really realizing it. So I was telling myself, I just want to experience people. and But really it was like, I need to experience people, otherwise I won't love myself. Yeah. And you know, I was unwilling to be, dishonest so i couldn't just cheat yeah. which i think is what a lot of people do That's they true. just cheat and lie and yeah. it's not that i was like so noble that i didn't i'm just i mean part of it was that i really don't like dishonesty but part of it is that i can't bear it i'm yeah. too anxious a person like the the fear of getting caught would just consume my life and ruin my life mm. so like that wasn't an option for me to be dishonest yeah. so the only other option was well, I could we could completely separate, but I still loved her. Yeah. yeah. Or we could try this thing that I thought like I think I got this. Yeah. I didn't got this. <laughs> mm. I had like I was yeah. like it was way harder than I thought. Yeah. Um, but it was a it was a great experience and you know, we had a lot of beautiful times and a lot of challenging times, but I wouldn't trade any of it. So moving forward, would you do open relationships again? You know, I don't I it's interesting. It's mm. really interesting because I almost feel like it's uh I almost feel like it's now, and I haven't even talked about this on many podcasts at all, maybe not even any. I'm probably four or five months out of the relationship, the open relationship. And I kind of feel like open relationship is a transitional, is a transitional arrangement. Mm, break that down. And so I think a relationship is stable when it's a monogamous partnership. But I think for most people, it comes at great cost. It comes from the sacrifice of passion that comes with the holding of some resentment but it's largely stable and you can build a family from that structure and but i think as you go into open relationship things get really volatile but mm. in the volatility is a lot of learning and a lot of growth mm. growth and learning that you wouldn't normally ever get it's from like yourself the, like, yeah okay. growth learning about yourself it's like, like that yin yang chaos and order mm. balance exactly yeah so as you push into open you push hard into chaos yeah and as you go into chaos you learn about your jealousies, you learn about your needs for validation, you learn about the way that you don't love yourself if someone's better than you. Like I remember like the first guy she started to see was strong. She, he actually worked out here at this gym. That mother... Uh, right? <laughs> right? And you went, don't come back. <laughs> and he was, he, was one of the, he was one of the only people that was stronger than me at this one feet of strength oh, yeah. where yeah. you could throw, you throw the ball over your head and you try to throw it as far as you could behind you and yeah. like for distance, right? Yeah. So it was like this strong man thing. And he was like stronger than me by like a good amount. Oh, <laughs> but, what was I, but what was I doing every day? I was in there practicing that. And I saw his line on the wall. I was like, I'm going to beat him. I'm going to fucking the- beat him. I'm going to beat him. <laughs> You know, and then, then she started dating a fighter and I was like hitting the bag. I was like, what am I doing? Mm. Like, what am I doing? So you learn like, I don't need to compete with these people at all the things they're good at. I just need to be the best version of me. Yeah. You know, like that's what, she loves me because I'm me, not because I'm a fighter, not because I throw the ball the farthest or not because of like, so you start to trust your own essence. Mm. And that was like the great gift of that is you trust that you're loved for absolutely who you are, not what you do or what you can do. And that was like a beautiful, beautiful lesson in that process that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So that's an example of one of the things you learn in open relationship. But the chaos of it, as you learn and as you're in pain and as you're struggling and as you're being challenged, it's a lot to deal with. So most people who try it, then they retreat back to, you know, some kind of monogamous relationship. Maybe there's honesty, maybe there's not, but it's at least somewhat stable, you know, until it all blows up if they're being dishonest, of course. Or you keep pushing through all the way to the other side, kind of like what we were talking about with wisdom, Mm -hmm. like where you get more wisdom, you can get into more worry and more anxiety. But if you push through to the deepest wisdom, then you can be at peace, just knowing that the most important thing is your own mental tranquility. As far as open relationship goes, I think you have to push all the way through to almost what I call, what I'm calling now, the no relationship relationship, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where you just love somebody unconditionally and 
no matter what they do, no matter what, you love them. And you can hang out, you can have sex, you can not have sex. If they want to be with somebody else, great. If they don't want to be with somebody else, they want to see you, great. If they don't. So it's kind of like single, but with all of the deep love of the deepest relationship, mm -hmm. just without any of the rules. Yeah. You know, and that's, I think, the place of like, that's, I think, the place that you can head to if you want, which is kind of an open relationship. Yeah. Yeah. But it, you, you don't even call it a relationship because everybody's radically free. Because yeah. yeah. when you have a relationship, you have expectations, yeah. you have things to uphold. I was always worried that she was loving somebody else more than me, but she lived with me and yeah. I paid the bills and then he didn't pay the bills, but you're loving him more. And it was this mm -hmm. whole mental chaos that I was in constantly. Yeah. But like you move past that to this more unconditional love arrangement where it's like, look, I love you no matter what. Yeah. Like no matter if we see each other once this month or zero times this month, or we see each other 20 times this month. Like it's, I love you no matter what. Yeah. So I personally think, and I don't know many people who agree with me, so I could be completely wrong, but I personally think that as far as a stable relationship, either having a more traditional monogamous partnership or pushing all the way to a more like unconditional loving arrangement yeah. um, are the two ways that you can get stability in a relationship. But all the steps in between are the ways that you learn about yourself and the ways that you grow. And you don't think you can be able to learn about yourself and grow if you don't go through um, the, the open relationship? I'm not me personally. Okay. Because I'd tried, I'd tried a bunch of different stuff. I'd read books about it. You know, I read the books about jealousy and I yeah. read the books about validation mm -hmm. and I'd done plant medicine ceremonies. But until like you're actually in it, mm -hmm. you don't really know what it's like. It'd be like reading books about being a UFC fighter and being like, I got that shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, John fought. Jones, no big deal. Yeah, like, yeah, I, yeah, I got this. Yeah, it's like work. But yeah. then like the octagon door closes. It's like, oh shit. And you're like, oh, this is something different. That's John, that's John goddamn Jones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And, and I think that's the thing. Like you can't really prepare for the thing unless you're in the thing. Until you mm -hmm. love somebody with all your heart and she's leaving for the weekend to go have mm. sex with somebody. Like that thing, that thing you can't prepare for. I think I'd rather get punched by the goddamn John Jones. <laughs> Easily. I would have I would have made that trade a hundred times. <laughs> or man, there's some there's some things that'll like there's some things that'll that'll make your stomach twist that you yeah. gotta like that you gotta deal with, right? Because yeah. some guys are gonna spank a girl a little too hard. You know what happens when you spank a girl a little too hard? Bruises. Really bruise marks. Oh shit. So the girl you love, your sweetheart. The one who you live and die for, the one who's like everybody, like lights up every cell in your own body. Yeah. She comes home from a weekend and she's just covered in bruise marks and bite marks. Damn. Like it makes you want to puke. Yeah. It makes you want to cry. It makes you want to like punch the wall. Like that feeling, go ahead, practice that. Yeah. Practice that all you yeah. want. But until you're there, until you're like there yeah. in it, yeah. you're not gonna be able to, you're not gonna be able to learn the lessons of that. And that's right. what's so fascinating to me because and the reason why I asked that is because at the very beginning, when you describe yourself as love. Yeah. And to me, I see you as somebody who's always giving, always pouring, always investing, like your embodiment of love. That's why Joe works for you. That's why we attract you. That's why you're able to create this great facilities and all your everyone I meet, like they light up around you. Yeah. So I see that, and to me. When people talk about open relationships, the, the one thing I've always was curious about is that like you're giving so much to somebody else and then somebody else will be with that person and then give lesser than. Yep. You know, or take. Or, or take, take or hurt or harm. And you and you literally and you're <laughs> have to take that back, you know? You have to constantly, like, <laughs> and just constantly, and then give. Like you said, literally, you're paying the bills, doing all this stuff, like, investing, doing so much, and he's doing nothing, you know? And then, like you said, maybe some days, some months, he gets 28 days, and you get three, you know? And it's, and that's why I always, I wonder, like, how conditional, how unconditional is your unconditional love? Mm. That's a good question. You know what I mean? Like, that's a good question. And, and, and the answer was... Not very unconditional. <laughs> Not very unconditional. Yeah. And, and like, because the structure itself, always, there was always some reason why I felt like I deserved more and that it wasn't fair. Yeah. And ostensibly, yeah, maybe it wasn't fair. Yeah. You know, like she had a boyfriend who all they would do is party. And all I would do, and so she would come home and she's exhausted from partying. And 
And like, so it would take her, it would, she would party for, with him for a week. God. She would take her a week to recover. Then she'd go party with him for a week again. And at that point I was like, yo, this cannot work. Like mm -hmm. I'm here working at the house to like take care of everything. Not only are you leaving to party with him, you're coming back. Worn out. Worn, worn out. Just mm. to recover. Just to recover. And go do it again. Go do it again. <laughs> so at that point, and she realized yeah. that too. She's yeah. like, wow, yeah, that doesn't fucking work, right? Yeah. Like so, but that was, you know, that was because we lived together and because I was yeah. finance. So we had to unwind that and unwind all of those elements. Yeah. And we started that process then because we realized like this can't work. You know, it can't work in this situation because I'm giving more than I'm receiving back. And he's getting Way ostensibly more. Way more without yeah. having to give anything yeah. other than his time and you know he's yeah. partying too but yeah. but like so it, there's a lot of tricky things that happen in an open relationship that are really challenging which is i think why ultimately i've kind of gone to the other side of which is you know live separately for me now yeah. you know i'm in a place where it's like i'm happy to live separately love unconditionally yeah. you know give as much as i want to give but not be obligated to give anything more than i want to give yeah. not be expecting anything in return yeah. and just be happy and content to love somebody yeah. you know for who they are and whatever they want to do but it's when you're obligated to give a certain amount of financial support or domestic support or whatever then you then you ex you're going to automatically oh, expect yeah. that in return and open relationship is going to challenge that all the time yeah. because as soon as you get a new partner you're going to be like temporarily obsessed with that person mm -hmm. yep. so even if that person is even if your girl or your guy is staying home with you they're going to be thinking about that other person all yeah. the time and it's and so it, cars and you know that yeah. and you know that they're texting and you know that like yeah. you know they're going to go in the, they go in the bathroom with their phone and you're like Ugh. God damn I know it, on FaceTime again. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah. it's it's a yeah. it's not a very stable structure yeah. until until you get to like a real place where can humans get you have to freedom. can humans get and this know. is one thing I mean Gary talks about it, me and him and wrestling with it. He's really good about saying expectations. Reality, reality and the, the the gap in between is frustration, anger, bitter, bitterness, <laughs> resentment. Yep. Can we really get to a place as human beings with with them? Unfortunately, we're trapped by our bodies. We're trapped yep. in our minds. We don't. We're not. Pure, I mean, we're not pure souls, right? Can we get to a place where not just romantically, but in every relationship, to give unconditionally to and the fullest nothing. and to expect nothing? Can we get there? I believe we can. Mm. I believe we can. I believe Sheesh. it's I believe it's the hardest thing, but the greatest thing that we could endeavor to do. Man. Like like you could build a big company, great. Lots of people have done that. You can make a lot of money, you could win a Super Bowl. There's there's noble things. Yeah. But like if you can be the one that can love unconditionally, well that's some shit that they write about in books that don't go away for thousands of years, mm. right? Like that's some serious and that's kind of an egoic way to think about it. But nonetheless, it's one of the greatest and rarest feats mm. that we can accomplish. And, and I think there are some people who I've seen living now who have accomplished that. Really? Uh, hmm. So there's a spiritual teacher named Ram Das who wrote the book Be Here Now. And he's in his last days. He lives in Hawaii now. And um, I haven't met him in person, but just watching his lectures, talking to the people who have been there, he seems to express that unconditional love. And then I did get to meet Don Miguel Ruiz, who wrote the book Four Agreements, Mastery of Love. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was a type of person that felt like every time you saw him, you got 100% of his presence. When he hugged you, he hugged you like the long lost friend that yeah. he hadn't seen for 100 years. Every single morning, every sip of wine that he had was like the very first and best wine that he's ever tasted. Every sunset he looked at was the very most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. Like he exuded a presence. And sure, I suppose that I only saw him for a week and maybe he was, you know, back to some other way at a certain point. But I think it is possible to achieve that. And I, I think even if it's not possible to completely get there, you know, I think it's a noble aspiration to have. You know, it's like, um, you know, shoot for the moon, land amongst the stars, as yeah. they say, you know, like shoot for that greatest thing. Yeah. And if you get even closer to unconditional love, yeah. closer to releasing your expectations, you're just going to be way happier and the people around you are gonna, you know, appreciate it so much more because it's so much more rare. Like the faster you can forgive someone, the less that you're gonna judge them. Mm. You know, the more kind that you're gonna be when they do something that, you know, 
they feel guilty about. Like all of those things are going to make a huge difference. Mm, that's awesome, man. Well, uh, we want to be you know respectful of your time, man. I've I've learned so much, so much man. I really appreciate everything that you share with us. So f for our audience, I have one last question for you. A thousand years after the robots take over the world, <laughs> <laughs> they're 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 putting together all the human. <laughs> information and knowledge and he stumbled upon the story of Aubrey Marcus what lesson do you want to leave with the world at the end of your life after all that you've done after all that you want to do that you feel like will continue to impact people for hundreds and hundreds of years <clears throat> well I think really it's the it's the lesson that you know, we are in the kingdom of heaven, mm. but it's our choice whether we see it as such or whether we see it as hell. And, you know, like to choose, to choose heaven. And that means to choose to see from the soul that we have inside of ourselves, to see through the eyes of love. And when we see through the eyes of love, we'll see heaven all around us mm. and we'll see heaven in everybody. And if we see through the eyes of hate and division and we see through the eyes of the ego, you know, we're going to see hell. And so, um, you know, I, if, if anything, you know, my legacy can help people look around them and see heaven and see love in all the places, the light places and the dark places, then, you know, I've, I've, done, my, I've done my job. I love that. Beautiful. <laughs> so uh, where can the people find you at? Yeah, at Aubrey Marcus on Instagram is my most active social platform, uh, Aubrey Marcus Podcast, and then go to Onnit, O-N-N-I-T, for any of the tools, equipment, supplements, any stuff related to my business. Yes, awesome, awesome, awesome. So guys, make sure you reach out to Aubrey. Let him know uh, what about the podcast set out to you guys. You know how we always encourage you guys to share out people with love. Make sure you do so. Check out Aubrey's podcast. My name is Hafiz. Chris is the show, baby. And we are joined by Aubrey Marcus. And we are the roommates and Adios. Adios.